very pleased to welcome you to today's session on the ongoing Ebola epidemic in Northeast Democratic Republic of Congo. My name is Rachel Sweet, and I'm an assistant professor of global affairs at the University of Notre Dame. My research focuses on armed conflict and politics in this part of Congo where Ebola has broken out. And for the past 10 years, since 2009, I've been working in this part of Congo um, at local universities um, with the Congo Research Group, as well as with the United Nations in various capacities. And I'm very pleased to be here um, alongside my panelists today. Um, today we'll be hearing from Ricardo Angora, um, who is a psychologist with Médecins du Monde. Ricardo has experience um, in, he has experience in human rights protection for people with mental disabilities. He has worked with refugees in transit in Europe, in Palestine, Israel, as well as refugees in the Syrian crisis and the Horn of Africa um, hunger crisis, among others. And he is currently deployed to the ground um, with Médecins du Monde uh, in Congo. We'll also be hearing from Dr. Christos Christou, who is the head of MSF. He's the international president since September 2019. He's been working with MSF since 2003. Um, also has worked with migrants and refugees in Greece. He's worked throughout Sub-Saharan Africa and Iraq, and he'll be bringing to us a perspective in international health and crisis management. I'm also very pleased that we have with us Zoe Kiavagendi, um, who is from this part of Congo where Ebola broke out, and who is working with the WHO as a risk communication and community engagement liaison. Um, Fiston Mahamba Wabiondi was meant to join us today. Um, he is the founder and the editor of Congo Check, um, which is a platform for um, fact-checking information coming out about Congo, trying to sift through some of the false narratives and misinformation about Ebola, as well as about Congolese politics more generally. Unfortunately, Fiston was unable to secure his visa um, here today, but I would encourage you all to check out the good work um, that Congo Check is doing. It'll give some of the most fine-grained perspectives um, and real-time analysis from the ground. Um, so the outbreak in Democratic Republic of, Republic of Congo, just to give some um, context, this is the world's second largest Ebola outbreak in history. In July 2019, the World Health Organization took the unusual step of upgrading this Ebola crisis to a public health um, emergency of international concern. Um, Although we have some of the best vaccines and best medical treatments available uh, to contain Ebola, this epidemic has been unusually difficult to contain, and we'll hear from our speakers today um, some of the challenges that are being confronted. Um, one of the main obstacles to containing the outbreak has been, the, uh, has been community resistance. Uh, two interventions teams. And community resistance includes both the reluctance and refusal of local populations to seek treatment, and it has also at times included some violent resistance and some violent attacks against health teams and Ebola treatment centers. This Ebola epidemic is a multifaceted crisis that brings in politics, um, security. It's the first time we've had Ebola or public health emergency in an active conflict zone. Um, it also brings in psychosocial um, questions of how the local population is dealing both with the trauma of Ebola uh, as well as ongoing insecurity um, before that, um, and questions of how to bridge the gap between community engagement and response teams. Um, my work focuses on the political and security um, aspects of this part of Congo. And just to give some political contextualization for the area that Ebola has broken out in, um, some of the ongoing and pre-existing security and political concerns of this part of Congo, even before Ebola, um, has continued to shape residents' perceptions and priorities during the Ebola crisis. Um, one of the main, um, one of the main background 
pieces to understanding this part of Congo where Ebola has broken out um, is a pre-existing and ongoing series of mass killings that has troubled the area since 2014. These mass killings are unusually brutal and took the population by surprise. And there's still something that local populations are dealing with alongside Ebola. Um, and reading the local newspapers and in interviews um, with the um, with community members on the ground, these mass killings are still what is cited as one of the primary security priorities. Um, this is an excerpt from a local newspaper um, from Beni in the northern part of North Kivu, which is one of the epicenters of this Ebola outbreak. Um, and in 2019, in July 2019, this newspaper um, published not the names of the Ebola victims who had died, but the names of the victims of the mass killings since from 2014 um, up to present day. Um, in the Ebola outbreak, there's been over 2,100 deaths. Um, there's been over 3,000 deaths with the mass killings, and so populations are um, dealing with both in tandem. One of the important political pieces of background to the security or to the Ebola crisis um, is that um, local communities um, were really concerned about these mass killings um, and that most witnesses of the killings um, interviewed by the Congo Research Group as well as investigative panels by the United Nations, um, most residents cited members of the National Army rather than armed groups as behind these mass killings. Um, so this is contributing to um, distrust for the government even before Ebola breaks out in this area. Um, as one of the witnesses interviewed um, stated, quote, only the authorities know who is killing, but they don't want to put an end to the massacres. As to their objectives, no one knows. And this is the, this is the political background for Ebola. Ebola broke out in this context where populations were already distrustful of the government, seeing them involved in these mass killings that have still... Um, that are still largely unexplained. Um, when families of Ebola patients were interviewed by local trauma counselors during the outbreak, they were still citing this distrust from the mass killings as one of the reasons why they might be distrustful of the government and intervention teams during Ebola. Um, interviews with local families said that, quote, Ebola has been at the center of attention for the whole world today, yet people are being killed in Beni as the international community keeps silent. Um, and that people don't trust the government based on all the perpetual killings happening in the region, the Ebola response should go back to local community leaders. So that's to give some context for the difficult environment um, that um, people like Ricardo, Christos, and Zoe are working in when they're seeking to contain Ebola, um, and some of the challenges behind trying to bridge distrust between intervention teams, the government, and local communities. Um, in order to learn more about some of these challenges and the perspective um, from the ground, I'd like to invite first some comments by Ricardo, um, who will tell us about some of the challenges that Médecins du Monde um, are encountering in their efforts to uh, build trust with the local community um, and to contain Ebola. Thank you for the presentation and good morning, everybody. I will try to outline the main challenges that MDM uh, has facing in the ongoing uh, Ebola outbreak in the Republic Democratic of Congo. Well, although in recent weeks there is a continued trend of declining uh, cases, the Ebola outbreak is still uh, active in North Kivu and Ituri, both uh, eastern uh, provinces of uh, Congo. But uh, we have to consider that there is an under-reporting community death, uh, approximately 30% during the last month. And uh, we must be uh, cautious about the figures that the, uh, show the uh, Ebola outbreak is de declining. Uh, we have considered also that there is uh, 
other factors like uh, uh, delays in case detection. Uh, approximately 70% of the people uh, infected who arrive to the uh, treatment centers, they arrive in uh, a delayed uh, state of the infection. And also challenges to identify and tracing contacts and for sure uh, poor awareness of the population. On the other hand, uh, we can see in that uh, the average of nosocomial transmission, that means the transmission uh, of the infection inside the uh, health centers, is, uh, uh, the, uh, is approximately 11% if we consider all the uh, outbreak. But uh, the last three months, this uh, average has uh, peaks about 20 and 25% in some uh, areas like Katwa or Butembo, where uh, MDM is uh, working. And a total of 162 cases uh, among the health workers uh, have been infected. Uh, the majority uh, nurses sent 60%. A survey uh, shows that um, the quality of health services is the most uh, valuable factor for the population in uh, considering to, uh, uh, the treatment that they receive in the uh, health centers. For this reason, MDM has focused the intervention uh, on upgrade the quality of services on health exchanges in two ways, prevention uh, measures of, inf of infection and mental health and psychosocial support. Because uh, this is, uh, as you know, a severe uh, disease but with devastating uh, psychological consequences in people affected and in their families. But during the intervention, MDM uh, have confronted several challenges that I would like to uh, outline uh, for you. First, uh, insecurity in the area. There are uh, numerous armed groups that are uh, active for years, and uh, although MDM has not been involved in any incident. Uh, the response uh, teams are regularly targeted by these armed groups and even the treatment centers. This has caused uh, movement restrictions of MDM teams. And also the access to uh, remote areas is uh, really difficult. So the steps that the organization uh, has taken to address the challenges has been movement limitations of the teams, low BCT low visibility profile, and for sure do not, not use escort for displacements to the health centers or to the community. And uh, security information uh, procedures. But there are also a uh, lack of trust in foreign organizations and uh, uh, rejection in some communities of the actors of the response, particularly uh, the government intervention teams that are viewed uh, with mistrust, as well as health agencies. The step that the organization has taken has been uh, hiring local staff. Uh, and MDM teams are familiar with local uh, thinking and local behavior. Uh, other uh, uh, challenges that the MDM has faced during these uh, interventions is the community resistance. Uh, the resistance of the population to take measures to prevent transmissions, such as fear of isolation in the treatment centers or fear of stigmatization for the community when they are uh, treated in these centers, uh, or negative perceptions of the treatment that they receive in the, in the treatment centers. But also rejection is increased in the case on, of, on home <coughs> decontamination. And recession for sure, uh, concerning the, burial, the burials without their own rituals and a fear of vaccination. The step that the organization has taken in these cases is training health professionals on communication skills. This is very important, the communication skills in a positive way with the patients in order to uh, transmit uh, the uh, accurate information about the uh, treatment, about the uh, um, uh, prevention measures that uh, it will be taken. As part of the community, the, uh, the health workers uh, 
can influence the community uh, and can aware the community because we uh, we have to consider that the health workers live in the community they are part of the community and this is an easy way to contact with, with the community and uh, to be trust uh, in the interventions that we have been done uh, also the community reluctance to use health services fear of contract of uh, the infectious disease in the health centers uh, and also the motivation of health workers and response teams. This is due to high level of stress and social stigmatization. And uh, to face uh, that, we uh, provide uh, stress management sessions to the health workers in the health centers, also self-care training that is uh, very important, and uh, as you can see in the slide, self-esteem reinforcement to continue working in this stressful situation for these uh, health workers' teams. And uh, at the end, I would like to outline uh, the weak coordination between the national outbreak response team and the local health services network. The uh, coordination uh, is very weak because the national outbreak uh, uh, national response team uh, system is a vertical program that uh, is uh, 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 coordinating from the Minister of Health. Uh, and the contact uh, with the uh, structures, the health structures, is not, uh, is not well done. So, uh, uh, for this reason, the response team uh, is uh, just concentrating in the community issues, uh, but it's important to work together with the uh, health workers and the uh, health, local health system. MDM uh, team uh, is involved in the two uh, systems, in the uh, national uh, response system and working with the uh, health uh, centers that are more proximally to the community. And we think it's the best way to uh, uh, provide a good uh, intervention, provide uh, a good uh, 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 results and also uh, to continue working with uh, uh, the community. Uh, for this reason, MDM has hired uh, uh, local uh, personnel, local health workers, in order to uh, work together with the uh, 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 structures of health of the uh, uh, areas that we are uh, intervening at, at that moment. So, um, there are uh, more factors that are influenced the interventions. There are more factors that are influenced the response and uh, that we can discuss uh, after uh, concerning the vaccination and concerning how can we uh, uh, have a good relationship with the community and uh, 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 to, uh, to be sure that uh, the, uh, the, the Ebola uh, outbreak is going to be solved in the proximal uh, three or four months, in my point of view. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ricardo, for that um, introduction to what it is looking like actually on the ground and for <clears throat> trying to think about how to build these bridges between local health structures, local health infrastructure, and international and national response efforts. We'd like to turn next to Christophe to, to continue this conversation. Yep. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, thanks for this invitation. It is really a pleasure to be here. I would like to start my just by briefly casting back to 2014. When MSF responded to that uh, outbreak, the situation was uh, full of uncertainty, as we know, and we quickly became very concerned that the world uh, was not paying enough attention to the outbreak. So at that point, we didn't have any vaccines, we had very limited experience and very few treatment options. So we wanted more. I'm sorry if I'm speaking too fast. <laughs> Today, a lot has changed. Uh, we are able to use several therapeutic approaches. We are able to roll out an effective and safe vaccination, and there is another one coming. And there is an accumulated experience uh, for those working in the front line. We have the magic bullets we've been uh, wishing, but still we can't say that we have the upper hand of this outbreak. We still can't get on top. 
And uh, we can see that in the figures, and we still are looking at more or less the similar overall mortality rates as back in 2014. So it's clear that we need to ask ourselves uh, hard questions about uh, what needs to change as we look to the future and what lessons to learn. But the first thing to say, uh, although having never been in an Ebola uh, 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 outbreak in my life, I'm a surgeon, I want just to uh, really start by saying an enormous message of gratitude, solidarity, and respect to those who have taken this challenge on and are trying to solve it. Ebola health workers. <laughs> Ebola health workers are doing an incredible job in uh, very difficult circumstances, we know that. Without the dedication of local and international medical staff and support workers, there would be no response. So their work is inspirational and we need to make that clear when we speak about lessons to learn. It's precisely out of a deep respect of their work and dedication that we need to not shy away from the hardest questions uh, of uh, this outbreak. So and now I'd like to briefly summarize the um, five points that I see as more important. Uh, of course, we will have time to expand later with the Q&As. So the first point is the structure of the response. It has largely been conducted through an injection of funding, we know that, and support for the creation, however, of a parallel health system. And this has had multiple negative consequences. Part of the problem is how these parallel system healthcare facilities are viewed within communities. Being specifically related to the Ebola response, these structures are often met with suspicion or even conspiracy theories. And such vertical approach has overshadowed somehow the already existing public system. Uh, we very recently had um, an up <clears throat> uh, we uploaded something on our site saying that many doctors and health workers have been hired by the international funded Ebola response, leaving health centers and the regional hospital, and uh, they, they left short of staff and financial support. So these are things that we need uh, to take into consideration, as well as that several vaccination campaigns in North Kivu have been put on hold or delayed as attention and resources are diverted to the complex fight against Ebola. My second point is around understanding the priorities of the affected communities. Too much of the response initially focused on what was important to the international community. So not enough time was spent understanding what issues were most affecting the local community and the areas that they needed assistance on. The fact is that for many people in the affected areas, Ebola is only one of a number of serious concerns they have around health or uh, health care. And uh, Rachel brought another very important point with the mass and killings. So um, look at the numbers of missile cases in DRC at the moment. I don't know if you are aware, but I think this is one of maybe the biggest outbreak of missiles we have. And already the victims there are exceeding the number of the victims we have from Ebola. And uh, deaths from malaria. So support and cooperation from the community is a vital part of the response. That means that every aspect of the response needs to be geared around the needs and concerns of the local community. And this is exactly the message here. Caring for patients, not just combating an epidemic disease. And that brings me to the third point, which is trust. The issue of trust is closely linked to many of the other challenges we face there, we know that. And there are a variety of reasons that trust has been a problem. And some of them are complex and very deep-seated, so I'm not going to mention them here. But what we can say for sure, though, is that we have not won a sufficient level of trust in the community. So far in this outbreak, roughly a third of Ebola-related deaths have been diagnosed in a postmodern mode, which means that this highlights that a high number of people avoided any Ebola-dedicated facilities when they got the symptoms. So now there can be several reasons why people might not make it to Ebola facilities, but trust is definitely a key one. Part of the trust issues that uh, stems from politics, of course, and given that this part of Northeastern uh, DRC has, been, uh, um, has seen armed conflict, <coughs> sorry, excuse me, for a quarter of a century or even more now, and has lots of armed groups. So uh, we can also see that through the reaction to the council presidential elections in uh, Beni and Butebo last December, uh, 
it is clear that um, it is the needs of patients and their communities that we must address first con uh, while we are considering this uh, Ebola response. Fourthly, um, we MSF are a bit concerned about the existing approach towards the vaccinations. And uh, this is quite a big topic, but it boils down to what MSF sees as too few people being vaccinated at this moment. Uh, you know how important it is. You know how that we, we try to approach with the ring approach in the area. We believe there is a restriction of the availability of the vaccine in the field and uh, uh, the restriction uh, related to the eligibility criteria. So we think that upping the number who are receiving the vaccination would lead uh, to a more effective response. Just to, indicatively to, to tell you that uh, we believe that uh, we should vaccinate uh, 2,000, 2,500 people every day, while at this right moment we hardly manage to vaccinate 500 or maybe 1,000. And this is why we have introduced the second vaccine uh, with uh, Johnson & Johnson now. We are about to start using that next month. So this is not meant to replace, but to complement the current approach because we want to increase the number of people who are vaccinated against the virus. The fifth and uh, my last point is a broader one. It has to do with uh, what we call securitization of the agenda. So in recent years, humanitarian crises have been increasingly viewed through only the lenses of uh, security. Patients have become threats. And that was the case with Ebola in 2014. We know that very clear. We know all the politics of fears behind this. But unfortunately, it continues to dominate the way the disease is viewed by much of the international community. So for as long as Ebola is viewed with this as a unique threat, it will never be properly addressed. We need to know that. The international community needs to realize that the health needs of affected communities cannot simply be ignored until an Ebola outbreak occurs. And the testimonies that we get from people are, please be here for us, not for the diseases. So, uh, yes, we need to treat Ebola, both at an individual level and in terms of the community, as one challenge that we have, one challenge amongst many others. And we need to aim to support these communities and their needs in a way that fosters trust and uh, cooperation. So I think my minutes are probably up. So just a take-home message. I think should be look at the forest, not just the tree. Engage the communities, gain the trust. And patients are humans, will always be humans. They're not threats. Thank you. Thank you, Christos, for those comments. Um, I just want to highlight one of the aspects of trust that you mentioned uh, when you mentioned the cancellation of the elections in this part of Congo in December 2018. Um, in December 2018, Congo held the national elections for the presidency, and the central government suspended the voting rights of people within the Ebola zone, citing Ebola as the reason why they couldn't go to the polls. One of the reasons this was important is because this part of Congo was an opposition stronghold. They would have overwhelmingly voted against the, um, against the president's candidate and for the opposition. And so community members viewed that as the government using Ebola for political reasons. Um, and that was one of the vectors that um, contributed to growing distrust and growing distrust around potential government motivations around Ebola as That's well. That's exactly a very typical example of instrumentalization of a disease. Yeah, um, exactly. Um, and case. there's a lot to unpack here, and we'll look forward to doing that more in q and I'd like to turn to Zoe now for a perspective from the ground and what her work has been trying to bridge um, the trust of local communities with this, with the response teams in light of this social and political um, and security context. Bonjour. Hello. <laughs> Oui, je suis Zoé Kiavayendi, je parle français, puis mon, mon anglais, c'est pas... L'anglais, c'est pas grand, donc je préfère parler français pour être à l'aise, quoi. So I'm sorry that I'm going to speak French, because my English is not quite up to the job, so please bear with me. OK, je viens du Congo, RDC, République démocratique du Congo. C'est en Afrique, 
précisément à Béni. Je attendu parler de Béni. Réellement, c'est ce qui se passe. Euh, premièrement, la ville de Béni, où le Nord Kivu est caractérisé par la guerre. Nous avons connu des massacres, nous avons connu beaucoup d'atrocités. Vraiment, on est blessé. So Et I... ça fait... Oui. Okay. I come. I come from the Democratic Republic of the Congo. You know, it's a it's a country in Africa, in uh, specifically from Beni, the the large city in North Kivu. This is a region that has been uh, um, tortured by so many armed conflicts. Uh, uh, we have seen many atrocities, many massacres in recent years. Oui, comme je l'ai dit, on a connu des massacres, on a connu beaucoup de choses. Euh, subitement, ça fait quelques temps, presque une année, on a déclaré l'épidémie d'Ebola chez nous. Ça n'a pas été facile, surtout la communauté comme elle était meurtrie. Euh, sous le silence coupable du gouvernement et de la communauté internationale, subitement, on a compris et on a constaté maintenant la forte mobilisation de la communauté internationale dans notre communauté, chose qui a créé des réticences, qui a créé des rumeurs. So, as I told you, we have seen so many massacres in, in recent years, and it was just about one year ago that officially the, the in, um, officially the in, an international emergency was declared because of Ebola in this region that has already undergone so many atrocities. Under the silence of the world and under uh, utter neglect by the government. And this fact that only due to Ebola an emergency was declared, while before we were utterly neglected, contributed to, to heighten even the mistrust and to the um, reluctance of the communities to engage in this campaign. Oui, on a été marginalisé, on a été considéré des traites comme on a travaillé avec les équipes qui venaient dans notre communauté. Donc toute la communauté considérait que nous, on était corrompus et qu'on n'a vraiment, on n'a pas vraiment de cœur. So those who engaged in this campaign of, for the treatment of Ebola were considered to be traitors uh, and uh, we uh, were even accused of being bribed and of uh, working for the money, but uh, we, we were accused of uh, treason. Oui, comme on a travaillé toujours avec les cœurs, on a compris qu'on doit sauver notre communauté. Et nous nous sommes vraiment tenus et notre incident manager nous disait toujours qu'on va y arriver malgré beaucoup de résistance et beaucoup de menaces à notre égard. So we, we um, took our um, heart together. We, we knew that we had to engage for our communities, that we did it not for the organizations, but we had to rescue our communities and... Uh, Despite that, we encountered so many menaces, so many threats were thrown at us. Oui, plus moi-même personnellement, j'ai été vraiment victime de beaucoup de menaces. J'ai été menacé par ma propre ma, ma propre famille même qui me traitait de traître. I myself have been subject to so many threats. Even members of my own family accused me of being a traitor. Nous, pour, pour y arriver, on a eu des actions à mener. On a mené des actions avec les chefs coutumiers. Plus dans notre communauté, les chefs coutumiers ils sont beaucoup plus écoutés dans notre communauté que tout le monde. Et pour briser des réticences et pour faire des actions, nous avons d'abord contacté les chefs coutumiers pour qu'ils nous aident à faire comprendre la communauté. Sinon, ça n'a pas été facile. So, um We realized that we had to involve the traditional leaders of our communities because they are those that enjoy most respect, more than anybody else in the world. So although it was not easy, we decided that it was absolutely mandatory to include them in these efforts. Oui, j'ai travaillé dans un contrat appelé Rwangoma, donc c'est l'ère de santé qui a beaucoup de jeunes brigands, c'est nerfs de santé, qui a connu beaucoup de massacres, et les jeunes de là, ils se sont constitués à une milice. Et quand on travaille là-bas, ça n'a pas été facile, ils nous séquestraient deux fois, mais comme on travaille avec le cœur, nous avons pu intervenir, et aujourd'hui, il y a plus de 60 jours, Saka Ebola à Rwangoma. So I specifically worked in the region of Ravagoma, 
a, a region, a, a community that was particularly um, tortured and, and attacked by those massacres. Uh, it was not easy at all, but I decided that I had to work with uh, all the power of my heart. And although uh, we had been threatened, uh, we uh, finally uh, oui. succeeded in oper making operation in such a health center. Now we have more than 60 patients under treatment. Et là, la, la contrée affectée par Ebola, c'est le nord Kivu, euh, l'Itouri, les zones vraiment insécurisées. The regions affected by Ebola are the region of North Kivu and Ituri, where the disease had, has hit hardest. Comme je dis, on a eu vraiment beaucoup de menaces. Euh, vous pouvez remarquer avec moi, il y a eu vraiment des atrocités. Les véhicules ont été entomagés, le, les maisons où le, les internationaux logés ont été ciblés par les, les groupes armés et ils ont dévalisé beaucoup de choses là-bas. As I told you already, uh, we have seen many acts of violence, uh, threats, atrocities, violent acts, um, sabotage for uh, the, the vehicles have been damaged, uh, the houses in which the international personnel live uh, have been under attack by armed gangs. Vous pouvez voir les, les agents, les agents qui travaillaient dans leur riposte, comme ils étaient considérés comme des traites et tout le monde pouvait les traiter comme ils voulaient. Au point où nous avons perdu des vues de certains parmi nous, il y a des médecins internationaux qui est décédé chez nous, les Camerounais. Il y a les infirmiers et les médecins qui étaient cibles de ces gens. Donc, il y a beaucoup de gens qui ont perdu des vies là-bas. Je pense que ça n'a pas été facile, mais avec le temps, on va y arriver. So we have had so many victims or attacks against international staff. Uh, there was even a doctor who died. Or, 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 or he came from, from Cameroon, from another country. And uh, you see all those damages that have been wreaked upon the installations of the uh, response team. Oui, de temps en temps, comme les rebelles n'avaient oh, non presque pas de cœur, ils ont tué les gens parmi nous. Ils ont aussi brûlé les CTE, les centres de traitement Ebola et les centres de transit. Uh, the, the rioters or the rebels have shown no compassion at all. They seem almost heartless. They have even set fire on the treatment centers and also on the transition centers. C'est ça. Nous avons compris que la, tout ce que nous avons connu comme résistance était lié à la mauvaise perception de la maladie. Comme on l'a dit avant, la maladie est considérée comme importée chez nous. Donc c'est une maladie, comme on était déjà beaucoup meurtri et nous on pensait que la, les membres de la communauté avaient la conception que la maladie aussi fait partie des menaces que les internationaux et le gouvernement nous effluent pour nous exterminer. C'est pourquoi il y a eu beaucoup de résistance, de méfiance par rapport aux gens qui pouvaient aller à l'hôpital, les contacts. On ne savait pas comment contrôler les contacts, puis ils savaient que nous, premièrement, on était des gens là pour les tuer. So, uh, to tackle the root cause of the problem, we realized uh, that uh, it was due to a misconception of the nature of, disease, of the disease. As uh, this region had suffered so much in the past, uh, the local communities thought that this was yet another plague that was brought, was imported into our region by the outside forces. This even increased the already existing distrust and there were rumors that this disease was concocted to exterminate our communities altogether. So there was so much suspicion, so much mistrust. Les membres de la communauté, ils avaient peur d'aller à l'hôpital. Pourtant, quand on reste longtemps à l'hôpital, on a peu de chances de survivre. Et c'est comme ça, les malades venaient toujours en étant vraiment très avancés. Et ils venaient toujours agonisant et Des fois, ils mouraient et ils ont considéré les centres d'étasite comme un mouroir. Et là, les gens avaient peur, ils ne venaient plus à l'hôpital. Autre chose, la, la communauté a plusieurs cultures. Il y a des cultures, jusqu'à aujourd'hui, là, ils ne traitent que par les médicaments traditionnels. Euh, 
Et quand vous dites à quelqu'un de venir se faire soigner dans un centre de transit ou centre de traitement où il y a des médicaments, des, des, des médicaments euh, modernes, ils n'acceptent pas. Il y a des religions jusqu'à aujourd'hui qui pensent que Ebola, c'est un mauvais sort. C'est pourquoi, au lieu d'aller au centre de traitement, ils préfèrent aller à l'église pour qu'on prie pour eux. Et malheureusement, ils perdent toujours la vie. People were, are also afraid to go to the hospital. They have no trust in modern medicine, and that's also why most patients arrive in our treatment centers only at a very advanced stage of the disease. So uh, the treatment centers are considered to be hospices, so places where you, go, you are going to die. But before, um, people do, would simply not venture to, to bring their relatives to us. Uh, uh, Second, there is also a traditional culture. Other healing practices are still very widespread, so people will not trust modern medical drugs. They would rather turn towards religion. They would even say this uh, Ebola disease is a curse uh, sent from uh, spirits or it's just a destiny. You can't escape it unless or the best thing you can do is not go to the hospital, but rather go to the church to pray. Oui, on a pu organiser des séances pour engager la communauté, comme nous, on est de la communication. Il y avait la couche de taxi moto. Ils étaient des vrais résistants. Donc, eux, les équipes de riposte ne pouvaient pas circuler puisque eux, ils étaient partout pour les, pour les intercaler. Nous avons pu le convaincre Ils se sont engagés de nous accompagner. Uh, so, yeah. so we we decided uh, to have sessions with the uh, local communities. We, the communicators, um, uh, d decided to launch this campaign, and and we decided that we needed to be escorted, to be accompanied by the taxi, ta taxi. Yeah, yeah. Before yeah. we were blocked, but now we can use uh, these vehicles to get around. Oh, oui. No, il y a aussi les jeunes qui étaient vraiment aussi aux activités de la rue Poste. Il y a beaucoup de membres de la communauté, mais pour le moment, l'engagement, euh, ce n'est pas encore à 100 mais on évolue quand même. On a senti l'engagement de la communauté, et chose qui nous a vraiment réjouis. So we have also seen an increasing involvement or commitment of, of the young, and these are all um, volunteers that uh, are increasingly becoming active due to our efforts. On a aussi engagé le, le responsable, le politico-administratif, pour que vous pouvez comprendre avec moi que la fois dernière, il y a eu élection chez nous, mais il y a eu beaucoup de soucis par rapport à ça, puisqu'on a exclu la communauté, puisque nous avons Ebola chez nous, et on n'a pas pu voter les présidents actuels, ce qui a causé aussi beaucoup de problèmes pour notre communauté. Then we have also tried to reach out to the politicians. As you know, last year there were the uh, elections for the president and our region was excluded from the vote uh, because we had Ebola and this also increased uh, uh, the problematic situation and uh, caused further mistrust. C'est une chose qui a renforcé le rumeur qu'ils avaient que Ebola était politisé. This also increased or fueled this rumor that Ebola was transmitted to us deliberately by the government. Comme recommandation que qu'on a pour pour notre gouvernement et pour tout le monde, nous on pense que si il renforce la sécurité, ça sera une bonne chose. On saura bien travailler et on va éradiquer Ebola. Mais aussi, si on délai les activités et renforcer la capacité de la, des membres de la communauté, ça sera une bonne chose pour que la communauté elle-même travaille et avoir les résultats. So our recommendations or our advice uh, to the government and the, to the internationals is that first of all we need a strengthening of the security that is uh, um, mandatory and it's uh, fundamental to improve the situation. Second, to delegate the efforts to the local communities and to train them to take their destiny in their own hands.
On pense aussi qu'on pourra mettre la surveillance à base communautaire, ça pourra aussi nous aider. It could also help if the surveillance or the monitoring of the situation would be placed in the hands of the local communities. That would also be helpful for us. Vraiment, je dis, je vous remercie pour votre attention. That would be good. Thank you very much for your attention. Oui, Rachel, je passe. Vous pouvez appeler 10 volontaires ici. We could call 10 volunteers here. Oui, 10 volontaires ici. 10 volunteers, please. Pas pour des questions, je Not veux for questions. Pas pour des questions. J'attends toujours les questions, mais les 10 personnes d'abord. Uh, ten persons, please. Um, would you please volunteer? Okay. J'ai quelque chose que j'ai amené. Ich hab, uh, I, I've brought something along. Oui, puis je suis communicatrice. Je suis habituée à sensibiliser. Je vous I'm sensibilise aussi que vous devez vous engager yeah. pour que Ebola yeah. finisse chez nous. Yeah. I'm being a communicator. I am trained to uh, sensitize people, to educate them. And um, it's now my task to sensitize you, to activate you, so that you can help us combat Ebola. You, ne you need to realize that you have to become active. You put them on. Oh, you put. C'est une bonne chose, ça. Oui, il est arrivé quelques temps où si quelqu'un portait les t-shirts Ebola, on allait te tuer dans la communauté, comme tu es considéré yeah. comme traître comme moi. Yeah. So Donc, some people who were wear, wearing this t-shirt have been killed on the spot, because they were considered to be traitors of the community. Mais en fur et à mesure, on avançait, les gens acceptaient de prendre les t-shirts et on est cessé à être les cibles, plus tout le monde désormais portait ça. So, uh, this already was uh, a means to raise them to the awareness that wearing this t-shirt made them a target of attacks. This et, là, et là, il n'arrivait plus à remarquer la personne qui travaille dans la riposte et tous les autres membres de la communauté. So, tout le monde mettait, everybody was wearing it, so and in the end, they just, they just didn't target them any, anymore because everybody oh, was wearing it. Oui. Yeah. Plus, au début, c'est nous qui portions ça, mais après, tout le monde a commencé à porter et on a cessé d'être cible. First, uh, we were the only ones to wear this T-shirt, but then everybody wore it, so there were no more targets. Everybody was, became a target. Et on a compris que ça nous a vraiment aidé à nous camoufler dans la communauté. So this helped us uh, to become uh, merging into the crowds, into the community, and it protected us. Okay, je vous aime beaucoup. I like you very much, thank you. Thank you, Zoe, for your presentation and for that fine green look from the ground. Um, I want to open it up to questions in just a minute. And for those following online, um, please do uh, pose questions on Facebook as well as um, the, the Twitter handle as well, hashtag HC Berlin. Um, I just want to pose one question from the chair to the panel. Um, and that is, we've been talking a lot about this community resistance and the difficulties that we've had cultivating buy-in um, to support the Ebola response. 
But at the same time, there has been massive mobilization by local journalists to try to broadcast uh, accurate information about Ebola and by journalists who have interviewed um, survivors of the epidemic in order to um, create the impression for the community that uh, the treatment centers um, are, are a place that you'll get good treatment and that um, you'll be treated well. There's also been efforts on behalf of university students uh, to create security hotlines in order to support the response, as well as by local customary chiefs and civil society leaders who have written open letters to the World Health Organization um, and other other agencies involved in the response to try to explain some of their political concerns uh, around the outbreak. So my question is, um, what feedback mechanisms do you see already in place to incorporate this mobilization on the community into your response efforts? And what further steps could be taken in order to build up those mechanisms where uh, where the good efforts of community members to support Ebola um, can be bolstered and supported by international intervention teams. Yes, there are uh, community feedback that uh, provides uh, from the community. Uh, there are uh, psychosocial teams that uh, uh, works um, with the community. And uh, there is systematically uh, meetings uh, on the that gather all the information that the community uh, uh, has uh, said to the, to the psychosocial teams. And uh, there are uh, uh, all the, the commissions, all the teams that are working in the field, uh, they analyze all the, the community feedback of the, um, of the communities. And they try to uh, answer the, uh, the needs that the community uh, has. And uh, this work uh, systematically uh, in, the, in the field, in Katwa, in Butembo, uh, where uh, MDM is based. And I think it's uh, a good way to, uh, to work together with the community. But also in the case of MDM, working with uh, health workers, because health workers belong to the community and they have a good influence uh, with the community in order to uh, establish measures to, uh, to prevent uh, the infection and uh, to uh, aware the population about how is it going. Okay, I think MSF and uh, social uh, civil society actually uh, it's a new relationship that we try to build more and more, not only in the field of Ebola, wherever. And we do have very successful examples from the past. For me, it's clear that the whole game changed in uh, HIV. It didn't happen just because MSF was so passionate at that time with the antiretroviral treatment, but it happened because we had the grassroots organizations and the patients themselves with the post-test clubs fighting for that. And now we know that, uh, indeed, the civil society should be, play the most important role. However, uh, we don't have those mechanisms to get the feedback all the time. We mainly, what we have is, uh, of course, uh, a very close relationship with uh, all the community health workers. But what is really innovative, to my understanding, and very, very encouraging, is that we try to, to decentralize all the care, all the, the, the approach. So we take the diagnosis out of the Ebola treatment centers. We bring it back to the communities. And even should the patients prefer to stay home and uh, uh, just get treated there, of course, we will try to support them as much as possible by you know, supporting with PEPs and post-exposure prophylaxis and um, other treatment, the whole family, the caregivers. So th this is what we are trying to build up as a new state of play. And uh, by doing that, of course, the feedback that we will get will be even more interesting and important. Oui, en fait, pour que les mécanismes qu'on a mis en place, il y a par exemple la remontée des informations dans la communauté. Donc, on a constitué les agents de veille communautaires qui sont lidés par le, les bourgmestres, euh, les chefs des quartiers. Donc, dès qu'il y a l'information dans la communauté, c'est par les réseaux qu'on remonte les informations et ça devient un peu facile puis c'est eux-mêmes qui remontent et eux-mêmes orientent. Oui. So we have um, also 
installed certain mechanisms, for example, an upsurge, an increase in information systematically being spread out, like uh, with the old mayors, uh, the elders of uh, the communities, we have set up a network of passing on information which helps to, to spread uh, true knowledge about the disease and uh, reinforces also the, the grasswork network uh, so that they can manage their own civic life. Oui, dans la lire où vaut les choses, nous avons senti déjà que l'engagement communautaire est à un niveau et peu élevé. So we have come to realize that the level of civil engagement in the local communities has already increased. Right. I'd like to invite any questions from the audience at this point, both the audience here present as well as the audience online. I believe there's two microphones at either side of the auditorium, and someone will walk around passing out microphones as well. So right here. Yeah, thank you. I'm Stefan Horstenmeyer, and I'm working with Medair, who is also present in Beni, and also involved in the response. Uh, and I have a lot of respect for my colleagues being there as much as I have for yours. Uh, and Madame Zoya was uh, in Beni, uh, recently in 2002, and it was, I had a lot of uh, fun there. It was a very pleasant place. Thank, thank you for, for, for having such a nice place and having such a, such a nice uh, city with great food. Um, anyway, my question. Uh, Chris, as you already had alluded to that, uh, there is also a massive measles outbreak. Now, my question would be, uh, I know that my colleagues are very worried about that, possibly even more than about the Ebola outbreak by now. Is there any, I mean, I know there are probably additional challenges, and it would be interesting to, to know them, but maybe even opportunities that, because there is this more known disease now uh, almost uh, overlaying the Ebola outbreak, uh, can, that be, can that be built on to actually uh, then have a, better response to both diseases? Yes, uh, that's a very, very good point because it shows exactly how we should be treating patients and not diseases. So I'm not saying that, oh, what a great opportunity we have missiles there. <laughs> I, I, not let me be misunderstood, but yes, indeed. And now uh, we are relaunching the whole, and we try to shift the paradigm there on how we should approach diseases to patients and the communities, and especially in places where have been uh, hurt by long-standing conflicts for more than maybe 20 years now. So it, it, it is important to be more comprehensive. And uh, the example that you brought is the, the, the real good opportunity to do these things in parallel. Uh, we. I think that uh, so far we don't have all the resources we need to also uh, respond to the uh, measles outbreak. And uh, it was a call very recently within our MSF movement for more resources also by other operational centers because it seems that it is getting out of uh, control. But that would be the approach. And thanks for bringing this into our attention. Great. I saw another hand up um, around the same place. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, I was a project officer during the Ebola response in Guinea. I haven't worked in DRC. So first, uh, thanks to all Ebola workers and my friends that are in East DRC currently. Um, I have two set of questions. The first one uh, is that after more than a year of epidemic, I'm surprised that the main uh, recommendation is to strengthen community event-based surveillance when we had very good examples in Guinea, Sierra Leone, uh, and Liberia of the mistakes to avoid to implement it and how to truly engage the communities into this kind of systems. So I wonder why after a year and a half it is still a recommendation. I understand all the difficulties in, in that place, but I would like to hear your insights on that. And the second point, it's related to what you say, the divide between health security to secure just only a threat Ebola, and human security, as you talked about it, um, the need to strengthen the, the quality of services, which is more 
in the universal health coverage approach. So I see that we have to uh, bridge the two and what would be your recommendations for this outbreak management and the future to try to work more on the quality of services, the access of people as a way to manage any outbreaks as measles or malaria. Thank you. I guess, again, the question comes to me, but also Zoe will have a point there to mention, especially about the community engagement. So, uh, yeah, indeed, uh, back in 2014, uh, we, les we, we found some lessons to learn, and one of them was very clear, the uh, engagement of the community. And uh, having finished that time and celebrating, you know, the end of the outbreak, we said, what else can go much longer than this? What could be worse? And uh, worse uh, was indeed uh, having a, such an outbreak in, a, in an area where there is an ongoing conflict. And that brought us uh, in front of uh, new very uh, big challenges and challenges that we couldn't foresee. Some of them, of course, we keep repeating the community engagement, but this is in another com completely different context now. And look at this very interesting slide that Zoe brought us about the refusals. 75% reluctance, 24%. These are the people that we need to change, you know, the, the, the whole mindset. And um, should that happen again in places where we've been before, I'm sure that it would be much easier. But here, there's a, 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 there, there's a complexity that um, we just try to oversimplify by saying, please, engage the community. But it's not. There are several layers behind. And one of the most important is, of course, sensitize. Uh, have a comprehensive approach, meet all their needs, and their needs is not Ebola. And the testimonies that we have from our patients are, uh, please stay here for us. I'm a mother, single mother, I have three kids. Uh, one is suffering by malaria, the other now missiles. And these are the things that they would love uh, from us to do. So this is the paradigm shift that we have not reached yet, because um, maybe also as doctors, sometimes we feel like, uh, okay, let's get things done now and treat the emergency, and then we will start talking. And we do understand that it will take more time. It's more, more co much more copious to get a community with you. It goes slower. But now we know that at the end of the day, the outcome will be multiplied. That's why we are launching the whole idea of decentralized care by improving a lot the home-based care and by also investing more in the primary health care facilities for the patients. Those facilities that they trust, those facilities that they are familiar with, and should they need something, they go there. We invest more on that. We don't build a parallel system. But MSF is just a, a, a small, uh, maybe leading by example, but small uh, uh, intervention in the whole uh, uh, DRC uh, uh, Ebola uh, report at this moment. Oui. Au fait, par yes, rapport the... à ça. Go, go ahead. Oui. Au fait, par rapport à ça, moi, je peux dire que l'engagement communautaire, l'engagement communautaire n'a pas être facile. Puis j'ai dit au début que la communauté était d'abord méfiante, euh, donc elle ne voulait pas coopérer. Quoi. Et comme le changement, c'est un processus, c'est comme ça qu'on est en train d'avancer, euh, ça évolue. Mais aussi par rapport à la perception de la maladie. La perception de la maladie, elle est un peu bizarre, puis vous savez, on a fait 10 épidémies en RDC, mais c'était la première fois au Nord Kivu et à Litouri. Et les, les informations que les gens avaient par rapport à Ebola, ce ne pas les mêmes informations, ce n'est pas les mêmes choses qu'ils ont vues. Quoi. Par exemple, on dit avec Ebola, il y a saignement de ça partout. Mais chez nous, ils n'ont pas vu premièrement ça. Ça a aussi créé beaucoup de, de rumeurs. Ça, ça a créé beaucoup de rumeurs. Et après, on n'a pas pu contenir vraiment les contacts, puisqu'ils se déplacent aussi, la situation sécuritaire. Donc, ils se déplacent, ils sont de contact de Rwangoma, mais quand il y a artocité, ils vont à, de l'autre côté. C'est comme ça, avec le temps, on est en train de, de les conscientiser et ils sont en train de, de comprendre. Comme c'est un processus, on pense que l'engagement communautaire reste toujours. Ce n'est pas un défi comme tel, mais on doit améliorer toujours. Comme je l'ai dit au début, engagement of the local communities was uh, 
very, very low at the beginning because there is uh, so much mistrust. They were um, simply, uh, they placed no trust in those institutions. Slowly, gradually, it has begun to change, but the root cause is, uh, again, a, a completely bizarre perception of the nature of the, of the disease and the information that is uh, going around in uh, those two regions in uh, North Kivu and Ituri are totally different from the ones that uh, you will hear in the rest of the country. And this increased the rumors that were heard that it was an evil thing that uh, they wanted to infect us uh, from outside with this uh, mysterious um, disease to, to hurt us and uh, to create havoc in our region. So um, still the commitment of the communities is low, but uh, we need to get it and to, to activate the people on the spot uh, to gradually improve the situation. This is a... Um uh, this is a conflict that there are in the, in the region uh, right now, but there are no, numerous uh, armed groups that are active for years, and this is, uh, this is a key factor because this prevents the epidemiological surveillance uh, teams and the epidemic prevention. And uh, also the, the attacks uh, regularly, uh, all the, the, keep, the keeps that are intervention in the area, and even the treatment centers. Uh, we can see that uh, at that moment, uh, the, the hotspots are in Kalunguta, Musinene, Mandima, and Mombasa, and they are uh, very active, the armed groups. So when, the, uh, like in other areas, the infection prevention now is working, but in these areas, uh, there are the, the more cases that uh, we, can see, uh, uh, we can see now. And in the other hand, the, the population of the North uh, Kivu and in this area, uh, half uh, are reluctant to the teams, to the uh, teams that came from the central government. This is a conflict that uh, it lasts uh, during years, and they are not trust in uh, all the teams that came from the government. And in the, th the third factor is that we have uh, talked uh, before that uh, it, it is important to uh, strengthen the uh, health centers the network health system uh, because is the, the possibility to uh, engage the community because the, the health workers belong to the community, they are well known in the community and they, are, uh, they trust on them. So this is the strategy, the world strategy to develop uh, in the future. Okay, thank you. I'd just like to add a little bit to this and to draw on what Zoe um, was saying as well. Um, so, based on the investigations and the research that I've done with, Cong with my Congolese colleagues on the ground, I think that one, some of the, the two big factors here facing Ebola are the presence of misinformation and rumors, as well as the distrust towards intervention teams. And what's really critical about this context and different from the 2014 outbreak in West Africa um, is that th this misinformation and distrust uh, was present in this area even before Ebola broke out. So you kept hearing Zoe talk about the massacres, these mass killings that have been ongoing in this part of Congo since 2014. Uh, what's really critical is that in the eyes of the local population, these killings have still not yet been attributed. You still hear the language of les inconnus, uh, the, the unknowns who are perpetrating uh, the attacks against the communities. Um, when we interview 226 uh, perpetrators of the killings, as well as uh, victims and members of support networks for the killing squads, the majority of them implicated members of the National Army. Um, and in this local community, it's quite common to hear about the military's involvement in the mass killings. And so you had distrust toward the government already present. And then when a new security threat that had never occurred in this part of Congo, Ebola, arrived, it became understandable why people would be skeptical of the government's involvement um, in Ebola. Um, how the government has talked about the mass killings. There's been a lot of um, false narratives surrounding the mass killings since 2014, and a lot of misinformation and rumors and shifting narratives around those killings. So this was already a situation of strategic misinformation and ambiguity about the main threat to civilian livelihoods. So it should come as no surprise when a brand new threat uh, that took people by surprise in this area 
was also affected by this pre-existing environment of misinformation and ambiguity as well. Um, let's open it up to some more questions. Maybe the woman with a stuffy bola shirt. Hey there. Um, my question is for Zoe. Um, when we're talking about the importance of community engagement, um, oh, sorry, better? <laughs> um, when we're talking about community engagement, there's a lot of focus on mistrust uh, from the community, and it's very much uh, like sensitization and you know, talking to the community about what the messages that we would like for them to hear in order to talk about the importance of Ebola treatment. Um, but I'm also wondering, Christos pointed out some other really important things like a parallel health system that's been established and uh, making sure that we're establishing uh, responses within community health centers that people are already trusting. And so I'm just wondering, um, with the uh, declaration of a public health emergency of international concern, what t other um, community-based initiatives are happening uh, through WHO um, to address the other needs that the community is facing? Ok, je, je pense que ce qu'elle a dit est vrai et que quand on veut engager la communauté, on doit passer un message, on doit parler à la communauté, c'est vrai. Mais il faut voir la communauté, quand elle est sceptique, c'est un processus pour que cette communauté puisse comprendre quelque chose. Et c'est dans le processus là où nous sommes en train d'avancer. Mais aussi par rapport à, à autre chose, elle a dit encore... Qu'est-ce que fait votre organisation pour les autres difficultés que rencontre la, la population là-bas Oui. Oui, je, je pense que L'Organisation mondiale de la santé est en train de faire sa part, mais il compte améliorer la, la prise en charge. Il compte améliorer les systèmes sanitaires qui est encore un peu bas. Oui. So what, uh, the statements that we have heard are correct, yes, but we need to understand why the communities are so skeptical towards uh, anything that comes from these organizations. And uh, as to your question, I think, yes, uh, the uh, WHO has undertaken first steps, but the major thing, the key thing here is to provide basic medical care because the system as a whole is uh, not up to the job. It has a very low qualitative level and one needs to work on upgrading the, the quality of basic medical care. Thank you. Are there more questions? Um, let's go in the back and then in the front after that. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Suzanne. First of all, thank all of you on the panel for your um, for sharing your experience and your insights. Um, I have a question about the particularity of the situation in Congo, because you've mentioned, all of you agreed and mentioned that um, it's particular in the sense that we have an, an epidemic disease and at, at the same time an armed conflict. Um, now I'm wondering to what extent this is figured in, in, the, in the response. So is it possible to get in touch with armed groups and also sensitize them about the risks of, uh, of the disease in order to also get their support? Um, yes, I would be especially curious to hear from Zoe if um, um, you speak a lot about community engagement. Is, is there, are there also approaches to um, get in touch with members of the armed group? Because I imagine they have quite a say and they're an important stakeholder in the situation. Oui, premièrement, j'ai dit que je suis présidente de la jeunesse de ma commune et que dans des contrées 
il y a des, des milices, souvent, ce sont des fils du terroir. Souvent. Les milices qui, 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 qui sont dans des, des, des territoires, ils sont plus des fils du terroir pour faire la défense. Donc, ils sont là pour l'autodéfense de la communauté. Euh, on, a, on a commencé les, à entreprendre les démarches pour leur parler. Et c'est à cause même de, de pour parler qu'on a pu eu accès dans des zones insécures. Donc, on a entrepris quelque chose et on les a rencontrés. Quelques-uns parmi eux, ils ont adhéré, ils se sont engagés pour aller engager les autres. Uh, yes. Um... As I told you, I'm, I'm uh, the president of such uh, youth organizations there, and we need to say that in many places, in many villages, uh, those uh, armed groups have uh, been established as a mechanism as uh, self-defense uh, against outside uh, violence. And yes, we have undertaken some first steps to meet with them. Some of uh, the members of those groups have uh, adhered to our mechanism and uh, have been sent out and uh, are trying to talk to other members of uh, the military groups. Um, so first uh, attempts have been made. Uh, there are several uh, military groups, uh, militias that uh, are active in the, in the North Kivu, uh, approximately 100 or 120. Some of them are in the border with uh, Rwanda or Uganda. But there are other groups uh, that there are the Mai Mai that belongs to the community. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, there are uh, 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 some uh, interventions, mm -hmm. some communications with the Mai Mai. Mm -hmm. And in different uh, areas, in different villages, they are allowed to uh, the, uh, the, uh, the teams, mm -hmm. the response teams, to intervene. Uh, and the epidemiological teams and the vaccination teams to, uh, to uh, develop their work in these communities. But this is hard because uh, there are uh, several groups and it's very difficult to, to contact with all of them. Hey, I, I would just um, add that what we're seeing in this area is not just an armed group crisis, it's also a governance crisis. Um, the, the first main violent attack, which happened in 2019 and burned down a treatment center in Katwa, um, at, at this attack, uh, notes were dropped by the perpetrators of the attack um, saying that they were attacking this treatment center because their rights to vote, the rights to participate in the 2018 presidential elections had been suspended. What that tells us is that the armed gangs around these areas view the Ebola response team as a vehicle of external influence that is working alongside the government um, and authorities that may not have, or that local civilians might be distrustful of having their own uh, priorities um, at heart. And so it's more than just armed groups, it's also about the distrust between this part of Congo and the governments and um, the government's involvement and insecurity in this area. I think we have time for one last question um, down here at the, at the front. Yes, hello, Florian Westphal of MSF Germany. Thanks very much to all of you for this fantastic discussion. Très grand merci à Zoé pour avoir fait ce long chemin de béni à Berlin. Merci beaucoup. I want to build a little bit on this last comment, effectively, and the role of the government, because, as you've all pointed out, uh, the government is an armed actor in this area, very active militarily, as it is in many other parts of the DRC. Um, the government is, as we've heard, not universally trusted, to say the least, in this particular area. Yet, the international financing of the response to the epidemic seems to be happening primarily through the government. And that largely also due to the World Bank involvement, which I think is quite new in an epidemic like this and deserves a mention. Um, I'm all in favor of a government assuming its responsibility for the health of its people, including a response to emergencies and to epidemics such as this one. But in this situation with this constellation and the government's role as an armed actor, is that not a significant risk to the viability of the response and especially the acceptance of the response by the communities and hence, in real tension with the humanitarian principles, which not only we as organizations want to adhere to, but which actually also most international donor governments say they adhere to.
No, I don't think I'm the right person to respond because I share exactly the same concerns. And uh, yeah, that was uh, also raised from the last uh, slides by Zoe again when we asked for, for, for security. What exactly do we mean by that? It's also very important to understand. And indeed, uh, trying to link that with the previous comment, uh, having such a, an outbreak in a, in a conflict is not just about access and armed groups in a traditional way that we used to, to, to have them in our minds. It is about so many other challenges that, um, uh, and some of them uh, we may feel that we may just overcome them easily by protecting us as health providers towards this, but uh, this can uh, lead us to a very wrong pathway at the end of the day. And if I'm allowed a general uh, comment, or we are about to close now, I have another comment, which is, <laughs> of course, we can see now the numbers are downtrending, which is quite encouraging, and uh, we may have good news very soon. So this, of course, doesn't mean that uh, for the people working there and for everyone that should not be still very alerted, the vice versa. We need to do our best now and put a lot of effort. However, having all these magic bullets that I said before, having the vaccines, having you know treatments, I'm wondering how much the international community and all these Western societies will still be very concerned about the diseases and other outbreaks in the future. Because back in 2014, 15, we managed to attract the attention by the Western society, by appealing as MSF a lot. And this came only and when they realized that this could be a threat for them in their own countries. And this may not be in the future again. So I don't know who will be left behind to still be giving these kind of fights in these uh, areas and these outbreaks. All right, well, so we'll take a closing comment by Ricardo and Zoe, then we'll have to close up. Uh, okay, we can see uh, in the field uh, every morning how the, uh, the response teams, uh, the response teams that belong to the government, uh, that are vaccination teams or surveillance teams, are protecting by escorting uh, 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 officers, uh, policy, the, the, the police or the, uh, the military, the army. But the uh, uh, NGOs, we are working without escorts. We are perceived with the community as uh, uh, different uh, uh, actors than the government. And we are more accepted uh, uh, in the, uh, working in the field. But uh, concerning the, uh, the all the therapeutic measures that we have uh, uh, now, we have to consider that the most effective strategy is the prevention measures based on a strengthening of public health. This is, the, the, uh, this is very important because achieving this is an effective uh, and sustainable way that requires a determined commitment to the development of this region. This is, I think, is the key point to, uh, to face the outbreak uh, right now. All right, I um, think that's a really brilliant question uh, that you asked, and it's also one of the main questions um, that, that I have as well. And as Ricardo said, it, it's the military officers and police officers that are escorting many members of the response teams um, to deliver the health care. Uh, but as they're doing so, that's also linking some of the um, authorities who are already distrusted for participating in insecurity against civilians to the response. So it's a difficult question of how to protect response teams in a situation where securing them with military force may not build trust with communities. Um, I'd really like to thank today's speakers for the insights about linking up with local health systems and about treating uh, patients and listening to patients' priorities, their other health priorities and security priorities priorities more than just a disease. So join me in thanking today's panel.